All right, so hello everyone. And yeah, uh, welcome to my presentation. Um, the title of my talk is Rethinking Agile. And I think the subtitle is even more interesting than the title. The subtitle is Why Agile Teams Have Nothing to Do with Business Agility. And well, actually that's the message I'm trying to get across during my presentation. Why Agile Teams Have Nothing to Do with Business Agility. And well, how am I going to do this? Well, the idea is that I want to tell you a story. I want to share a story um, with you of an organization. And this organization, they had some problems. Um, I guess a lot of you probably know this. Um, their time to market um, of projects, initiatives, it was way too high. It took forever until they could deliver something to the market. And if you have a problem like this, there are other problems actually tied to this. So they felt that they can no longer act proactive in the market. I mean, they have ideas, they see opportunities and everything, but uh, it takes longer to set up a project and then the opportunity is basically already gone. And the other thing is they wanted to be prepared for continuous change. They were like, there is so much going on out there new business models, new companies all the time, new technologies, artificial intelligence, chatbots, uh, bitcoins, and so on and so on. And they were like, damn it, future will definitely uh, take place. But if we don't change the way how we act on the market, it will take change without us. So they were like, okay, we need to fundamentally change the way how we work. And guess what their answer to this uh, problem was? Let's become agile, right? Because with agility, we can address all these uh, problems, of course, right? So, well, that's what they did. They started an agile transformation, right? Uh, what did they do in their transformation? Well, the very first uh, thing was they built cross-functional teams. They were like these functional silos. They are evil. We need to get everything that's needed into one team so that this team doesn't have any dependencies. So we need to tear down uh, the functional silos. We need to build cross-functional teams. Then they were like, okay, we also need product teams. So cross-functional teams alone is not enough. We need cross-functional product teams. What does this mean? Well, the idea is that a product, uh, uh, um, uh, cross-functional product team, um, one team is only working on one product. This means that uh, you, again, reduce dependencies, right? If just one team is working on one product, you don't have dependencies. That's what, uh, what, what actually was uh, in their mind. So cross-functional product teams. What else? They were like, let's not be too dogmatic. Let's not be too dogmatic. And the teams, they can actually choose their favorite agile method. There are only some minimum requirements each team has to fulfill. One requirement is visualization. Each and every team needs to make their work visible. And I mean, it, it's a good idea. So the, the intention behind it was that um, when a team is having a problem, it can directly point to the problem and you can easily start a conversation with the team and yeah, work on the problem. So each and every team needs to have a board visualization, right? That's what agility is about. Um, what else? Each and every team needs to have a fast feedback loop, a stand-up meeting, uh, where, which, which is basically a short coordination meeting. Like each and every team needs to do stand-up meetings as another requirement. Uh, Another requirement was each and every team needs to do retrospectives, improvement meetings. So we want to continuously improve as a team. This was the intention and the idea um, of this organization. And finally, measurements. Each and every team has to come up with at least two measurements. One measurement for how fast are we delivering, something like lead time. And the other measurement is how much in terms of quantity are we delivering? And uh, yeah, a measurement could be, for instance, throughput. So um, these were, this was the idea of this transformation, actually, uh, roughly summarized. And if you've just only read one Agile textbook, you probably think now, awesome. I mean, they really understand what we need to do. No matter which textbook we read, that's what we need to do. And then we are Agile. Well, that's what they did. They started... Uh, one and a half year transforma uh, transformation project. Um, this is exactly my kind of humor, actually. So <laughs> we 
We want to become agile. And the first thing that pops up in our mind, let's build the waterfall plan, how to become agile. Well, maybe not uh, the best way of approaching this, but um, yeah, we can talk about this a little bit later. So, um, but yeah, they set up this one and a half year transformation project. And the very first point in this uh, project was 600 people are running around here and they need to receive some kind of basic agile training. Um, you've probably heard that agility is not so much about the practices. It's much more about the mindset. Have you heard about this? Agility is a lot about the mindset. We need to make sure that everybody has the same mindset and the right mindset. If the mindset is just there, everything is great, right? So what they did, they set up this one day agile mindset training. And yeah, well, <laughs> after this day, they could basically check the check mark in their project plan, like agile mindset checked, done. Um, well, I'm not sure if it's working like this, but okay. Um, what else? Then they were like, okay, of course, we need to carry out the reorganization. We have these cross-functional teams now and everything. So let's throw up the people in the air and yeah, they land in this new cross-functional product teams. And then we start agility working in an agile way, team by team. Yeah, this was the idea. In the beginning, the whole thing was supported by 16 external coaches which is really cool when you are running a consulting company uh, because you can really earn quite a lot of money here. Um, well, um, not sure if it's so helpful for the organization, but that's again, another topic. But yeah, 16 external coaches. Uh, and the other thing is 11 internal coaches were um, built up, which is actually quite smart if you think of it, because uh, what we see quite often is that, um, yeah, as long as the external people are here, everything is kind of working okay. But then when the externals are leaving, um, many people are like, oh, yes, now we can finally switch back to normal. But you don't want to switch back to normal here if you invest so much uh, money and time, actually. So it's, 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 it's a smart idea to build up these internal coaches. Well, this is uh, more or less um, the highlights of their transformation plan. After roughly a year, they reported that 80% of the teams were fully transformed. Kind of like this language. Reminds me of the Borgs in, in Star Trek. Uh, resistance is fruit, fruit, fruitile. Yeah, uh, so 80% of the teams were fully transformed. What does this mean? In the end, it means that we can check quite a lot of our check boxes in our project plan. We've seen stand-up meetings. They're doing stand uh, retrospectives over there. Here's the board. So check, 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 check. Um, that's what we see, right? There was one checkbox called metrics. And they were like, okay, nice. So teams are gathering metrics. Um, let's take a look at the metrics. I mean, what can happen, right? That's what they did. So um, I will show you some metrics here. And um, the, the, the measurements that you see, these are trend charts of multiple teams. So it's not just one team, it's more or less a collected data for multiple teams. And then it's a trend chart over time, how um, yeah, the, the data um, yeah, transformed. Um, this is a scrum sprint velocity chart. What is the scrum sprint velocity? Sprint velocity, I guess uh, we are at an agile conference, everybody knows this, this is a kind of throughput measurement means like, how much user stories, how many user stories are we um, delivering? Um, so on the x-axis, we have the time, and on the y-axis, we have um, the velocity. And the expected result was to see a chart like this. In the beginning, there's not maybe not so much velocity, but this will definitely go up. And um, yeah, then it will flatten out, of course, a little bit, but still it will steady increase uh, our velocity. So this was the expected result. The actual result looked like this. And they were like, hmm, what's going on here? I mean, yes, in the beginning, it somehow picked up the uh, velocity, but then it went down. So they were no longer improving. So they were like, hmm, well, there's something wrong. So uh, you could already hear the first voices in this organization like, yes, we always told, told you Scrum is not working. Kanban is much better for us. So, um, well, good, we also have data from, from camp and teams, right? Uh, again, this is um, the aggregated team lead times, a trend chart of the lead time of um, the camp and teams. Um, lead time is 
uh, speed measurement, basically. How fast are we delivering, right? On the x-axis, uh, the time, and uh, on the y-axis, the lead time. And the expected result was to look like this. Of course, uh, the lead time shall drop, shall go down. We should become faster, right? Um, yeah, and if you, if you see a chart like this, you're like, yeah, sure. That's the minimum you need to achieve. I mean, have you ever read one of these camp and case studies? I like them. Uh, most of the camp and case studies, they're like, our teams are two times faster, four times faster, 10 times faster. You know, everything's possible if you're just doing camp. Um, well, so this is the minimum that you can achieve. Um, guess what their actual result was? It looked like this. And well, with a little bit of fantasy, you could say it's not getting worse but it's definitely not this kind of improvement everybody was uh, expecting. And they were like, okay, what's going on here? Something is, is totally wrong. We need to be careful here because um, these are team charts and we are, and the problem with these team charts is that we cannot compare them because the teams, remember there was a reorganization, they didn't exist before. So we cannot compare it like, okay, that's the new org setup and that's uh, our performance of the teams and the old setup because it's different teams actually. However, there was one metric in this organization which you, could, which you can compare. It was there before the Agile transformation and it's there during the Agile uh, transformation and afterwards. This is the time to market of their initiatives, of their projects. Um, this is actually the reason why they started this whole Agile journey, because what they saw is an increase in uh, lead time. And then they were like, we need to change something. And we expect when our entire organization is uh, yeah, becoming Agile, our time to market will go down. So this was the expected result. Guess how the actual result looks like. It looks like this. And you know, this really hurts. If you've invested so much money like they did and uh, you actually see that it's getting worse, it's not only not getting better, it's getting worse. It takes even longer to ship to the market. You're like, what the fiddlestick is, what the fiddlestick is going on here? So that there, there is something totally wrong. And well, that was basically uh, the point in time where they contacted me. They contacted me and they were like, Klaus, we heard you talk about local optimization and global sub optimization and stuff like this uh, on conferences and so on. Can you please uh, visit us and have a look what we are doing? Maybe something of what you were talking about all the time of is true in our organization. So at this point in time, I basically had roughly the same amount of knowledge that you have. So I heard this story so far, and that's pretty much it. What I would like to do, Eric, can you please paste uh, the link? What I would like you to do is to come up with some hypothesis. Please go to polev.com slash Klaus222. There should be a link in the chat very soon. And um, yeah, come up with some hypothesis. What do you think is the problem? The point is, we don't know it right now, right? I mean, we can just come up with some hypothesis, but what do you think uh, could be the problem in this organization? Give us some very quick um, thoughts. So just go, okay. I like this one, doing agile instead of becoming agile. Nice one, yeah, cool. So it seems to work. No Wi-Fi. <laughs> I like this one. <laughs> okay. People were not ready to work in such methodology. Very good. Not focus on the customers. Wrong metrics. Mindset related. Yeah. Nice. The metric was used to measure output. So I guess not outcome that what he or she means. Nice, overly focused on process, not enough. Yeah, cool. The business culture is still not agile. I see this so often. The rest of the business is not agile. The same again here. They didn't change the organizational uh, culture. Oh, wow. 
I think uh, there's quite a lot of people in the audience who really know what's what's going on because uh, I mean I've seen so many things that that you come up here. That's just great. No synchronization between teams. Good one. Cool. The size of teams. I also like this one. Cool. Yeah. So uh, thanks for for the first um, impression here. Um, the poll is still up, and in the end, I can just uh, give you, including to the slides, all the, the answers to the poll, so that we see uh, what, um, yeah, what you guys uh, think. Cool. Thank you so much for the first poll. Later, we will do um, another one. So uh, remember the URL. Um, yeah, what I see here, I think there is really, I guess I, I've seen each and every of the problem that I've discovered uh, in this organization, which is really cool. So um, yeah, what did, um, what did happen next? Well, I visited them and for, uh, I visited them for, for two days and I was talking to the teams. So they were like, okay, take a look what's going on and yeah, let's figure out what the problem is. So yeah, that's what I did. I searched for the causes. So um, what I did, I basically went to the teams and I started the conversation with them. And the first thing um, I talked about was dependencies. So the cool thing in this organization you really have to tell is each and every team, they had a board. So visualization was one of their requirements. So no matter where I uh, went to, I could see a board, which is cool because now I can just start talking with them about what I see. And well, that's a very simplified team board, what I've seen over and over again. It's like backlog, the stuff we want to do next. Okay, we already committed to deliver this, develop, we are working on this and done means done, right? So um, this also matches uh, exactly to a sprint uh, board, uh, to, a, to a scrum board, for instance. So we have the product backlog, we have the sprint backlog, we have work in the sprint, stories committed in a sprint and um, done, yeah? But there was one thing what I could see on each and every of these boards and this is this, external waiting. So each and every board, they, they had some, some, some parking lot like external waiting and external waiting in their case meant we can no longer work on this work item here because we are waiting for another team. Um, if you're working in a little bigger organization, I'm pretty sure that you've seen this situation before, right? Um, so we cannot work because uh, we wait for another team. So what does this mean? Let's uh, think of it. Uh, let's assume each and every team has a, has a visualization like this. This would mean that there needs to be a second board somewhere in this organization. And when team one is blocking something here, uh, and waiting for external. This means this creates demand for this team two, right? Uh, team two is doing, I don't know, magic estimation, queue replenishment, whatever uh, kind of thing. Uh, then they start to work on this work item. And when it's done, they can usually unblock it here and they, can, they can continue, right? So this is usually what's going on when we see um, a dependency. So what I did next is, I started to ask all the teams, where do you have dependencies to? And I drew a dependency chart and the dependency chart looked like this. So um, you can see there's really a lot of dependencies. I mean, I've just illustrated um, eight teams here, but you can imagine for 600 people, you have more than only uh, eight teams, of course. But the question is, why are there so many dependencies? I mean, this organization did everything exactly to avoid um, dependencies. Remember, they were doing cross-functional teams, doing product teams, cross-functional product teams, but we still see so many dependencies. How is this possible? Well, multiple reasons. First, yes, it's true. One team is only working on one product. However, multiple teams are working on the same product. This means, of course, if there's other teams also working on my product, what a surprise, I will have dependencies to them, right? Another thing is um, the products were not completely independent. I guess everybody knows this. So when we change something in this product, we need to change something in that product and we need to change something in that product. So there were dependencies um, among the products. 
And in the end, we're talking about 600 people. I personally have never ever seen an organization in knowledge work with more than 30 people without any dependencies. So for me, it's just crystal clear that we see dependencies here. And yeah, whenever I think of dependencies, it pops up a picture in my mind, a picture of a keyboard. Let's assume our organization is a keyboard and we are in the writing business. So what we do is we write letters or stuff like this for our customers, right? Okay, so let's uh, set up our organization. These are the teams, one, two, three, four, okay? Team one is only responsible for the um, number button uh, keys here. Team two is pressing Q, W, E, R, team three, A, S, D, F, and so on. And now there comes the customer and the customer says, I want to have you, I want you to, uh, to write me a love letter. And now we need to think how we can actually deliver this love letter, right? However, if you are working in an organization with more than four teams and 600 people is more than four teams, your keyboard probably looks like this. For each and every freaking key on your keyboard, you have a team which is pressing the, the key. We have a, a W team, we have an E team, we have a D team, we have an F team. Each and every organization, of course, needs an A team. Without A team, you're basically screwed. And yeah, this is um, how our organization looks like. And now let's assume we are optimizing all these teams. And finally, we have high performing teams, the holy grail of agility. Um, we have the best U team on this planet. When the U team starts to press the U button, smoke is coming out of the water. G is international benchmark and D is the best team ever on this planet. How much faster can we deliver our love letter? Not at all, right? So we won't see any improvement because the point is when I'm operating a keyboard, it's not so important that I hit each and every key very fast. It's way more important that I press the right key at the right time. This could be even a little bit slower, but if I make sure that I press the right key at the right time, I can deliver my love letter much faster. And the same is true for, um, for our teams. Um, it's not so important that each and every team is working very fast. It's way more important that we make sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time. This is where we actually can increase um, our performance. Make sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time, right? There was a guy called Russell Eckhoff. And Russell Eckhoff already said, I guess in the 80s already or, the, or 70s, 70s, 80s, that uh, the performance of a system is not the sum of its, uh, of its parts. It's the product of its interactions, the product of its interactions. So we need to uh, make sure that we optimize the interactions. What does this mean when we transfer this quote into our agile world? Then we can say agility of an organization is not about having many agile teams. If you want to have business agility, organizational agility, then it's about having agile interactions between the teams. We need to make the interactions agile and not so much the teams. Of course, agile teams are awesome and it's totally great if we have agile teams. But if we don't take a look at the, at the, at the interactions between the teams to make sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time in an agile manner, uh, we will never achieve uh, business agility. And that's the problem in this organization, actually. They were just focusing on their reorganization. We need to tear down these functional silos because functional silos are bad. We need cross-functional teams. Well, that's what they did. They teared down the functional silos, fair enough. But what they did, they built cross-functional silos. It's not so much better. <laughs> so the point is, it's not so important how the team setup looks like. Of course, it's a difference if you are working in a cross-functional team or in a, in, 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 in a functional team. But the point, no matter how your um, team setup looks like, what we need to do is we need to drill interaction holes into these walls. We need to target the walls and not the teams. And that's um, what this organization didn't do. So my first uh, finding in this organization is that they didn't uh, pay attention on actual interactions. So I have three causes, uh, which causes the problem actually. 
three causes. This was cause number one. So I will stay a little bit more in the problem domain and later I will switch to uh, the solution domain. So cause number one, no actual interactions. What else? Remember I was talking to the teams and well, when I was talking to the teams, I was also talking about the workflow. So remember, we had these boards, everywhere fantastic boards. Now I was challenging, am I seeing everything that I want to see? So my question was like, okay, so your team is developing here and after development, they are done. This means the customer is totally happy and everything is great. And they were like, well, no, after development, of course, we need to do some integration work. And I'm like, okay, that's good information to have. I don't see it here. So let's put up another column on the board, like waiting for integration. And then, um, yeah, we see that we are waiting for an integration here. I mean, that's the whole point of visualizing the situation to see what's actually going on, right? So I was like, so now we're developing, we're doing the integration work. And after integration, customer is totally happy. They were like, mm, no. Um, after integration, of course, we need to do some acceptance testing. Okay, cool. So let's come up with another column here. I mean, that's the reason why we have this board, waiting for acceptance. But now after acceptance, the customer accepted it already. So he's totally happy, right? And they were like, mm, no, it's not easy like this. You know, we have these release windows and it has to fit into one of these release windows. And yeah, so let's come up with another column like waiting for release. And, but then when the release is done, the customer is really happy. And they were like, most of the time, yes. Okay, good. So um, that's good information to have. We didn't see this before, right? Um, because if we don't see it, we then, then we cannot continue to ask questions. And everything what we are doing here is, for me, it's just like asking questions all the time. Why is it like this? And yeah, if we see this, my next question is, okay, how long did it take? So how long does work spent in each of these columns? The answer was this. The integration is done on a monthly basis, um, the acceptance testing on a quarterly basis and waiting uh, release also on a quarterly basis, four times a year. We want to improve time to market. So this is all part of our time to market, of course. So we also need to address this, right? We didn't see it before. Now we see it, now we can address it. But I wasn't happy. I was like, okay, that's good. Now that's uh, kind of the downstream. But what's going on here on the left side of the board? So we see something like a backlog. This means um, here is the great new idea and then you start to develop and uh, everything is happy. And they were like, well, it's not so easy, of course. Uh, this is just the development backlog. Before we start to develop, of course, we need to do some analysis work. Now like, okay, sure, let's come up with another column like analysis. So we have a product backlog here. That's the great idea. Then we do some analysis work. It goes into the development backlog, goes into next, then we develop and so on and so on. Uh, so product backlog analysis, we start here. That's the great vision. And they were like, no, actually our board looks more like this. So first, uh, we, we, we collect all the new ideas in the pool of new ideas. Then we're doing a kind of triage. Then we are writing a rough business case for those uh, who went through this triage. Um, this is waiting for a committee for approval. Uh, those who got improved, uh, approved, we need to write the detailed business case. And then it's again waiting for approval and then we are in the product backlog. So if we zoom out a little bit here, their process actually looks like this. And again, I like this kind of visualization because whenever I see something like this, I can again ask questions. And the questions were, of course, how long does it take? And this was the answer. On a monthly basis, we are doing uh, the triage. On a quarterly basis, uh, the steering committee is uh, meeting. And on a yearly basis, we are... Um, approving the detailed concept. We want to improve time to market of our, um, of our uh, initiatives. Do you see some levers that we should pull? Um, well, I see many levers actually. They were like, yes, we also know what to do. 
development, problem discovered. Let's make development agile and we're so fucking agile and it's just awesome, right? Well, um, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. If we just take a look how long it takes until uh, something is delivered and how, I mean, it's just rare cases that someone is working uh, on the work. So it doesn't make any sense to improve this teeny tiny wheel in this entire process if work is uh, lying around everywhere uh, and nobody's working on it. It's always sitting in these uh, kind of things here. I mean, of course, you can make your development uh, agile. That's, yeah, not a problem. That's, I mean, that's maybe, that's maybe agile software development, fair enough, yeah? But this has nothing and really nothing to do with business agility. That's totally two uh, different things. One thing is having agile development teams. The other thing is acting agile on the market. And in an, in a, in an environment like this, no matter how, much, how many uh, agile teams you have, this company acts lame on the market as before. So nothing changed there. And this was uh, my cause number uh, two that I discovered. There was totally no end-to-end -end flow. So they were just improving or uh, optimizing one teeny tiny part of their entire value creation chain, but there was totally no end-to-end -to -end, uh, view of what's actually going on in this organization. Cause number two, one more cause. Cause number three, um, about the strategic portfolio. So, um, before I talk about the strategic portfolio, um, we need to go back to our teams, okay? So this is one of these uh, boards that I see quite often on the, on the team level. And what I've also discovered is there are fancy numbers on top of the boards, some of the boards. Working process limits. Um, have you heard about working process limits? I guess it's it's uh, it's an awesome thing. So a lot of camp and teams are limiting the working process. This means they are focusing on finishing work instead of starting work. This means not more than four items in this column. So I cannot start a new item before I delivered one of these items. So stop starting, start finishing. And that's a cool thing. So Kanban is using working process limits. If you are working in a Scrum team, for instance, a Scrum uses time boxes for it, like sprints. So we don't start working on the entire product uh, backlog. Um, yeah, now we just pick a couple of uh, stories. We finish them after two weeks, three weeks, or whatever your spring length is, and then we can start new work. So stop starting, start finishing. And uh, this organization, they were creating focus. They were using uh, whip limits on the team level and they were also using uh, sprints in the scrum teams. So they created focus around their work. And that's great. That's really great. There's a lot of uh, literature behind uh, creating focus and it's just one of the best invention of mankind. <laughs> when you are able to create focus, your switching overhead goes down, your cost of delay goes down, your system predictability goes up, uh, your, your, way, uh, your delivery risk goes down. So there are so many, so many things that, um, yeah, where you benefit from when you are creating focus with time boxes or uh, whip limits. You see bullet number two here, cycle time and time to market goes down. I mean, that's so great, right? And the cool thing is um, you don't have to believe it. <laughs> There's a mathematical proof called Little's Law, which basically um, yeah, says that it's mathematically correct that you're, um, that you're becoming faster when you're creating focus. So it says time to market goes down. However, this organization, they created focus. That's what we've seen on the boards. But their time to market was going up. They were becoming slower, although they were creating focus. So did they just falsify Little's Law? Well, no. <laughs> when you are creating focus, there is, let's say, the fine print. And unfortunately, I guess 99% of the organizations have never read the fine print. So a little bit bigger, that's the fine print. The point is, you need to create focus on work items where you want to achieve the benefits. So it's not about creating focus about random work items in your organization. You need to focus on these work items where you want to achieve the benefits. What does this mean? This organization 
they were working on initiatives. Yeah, they split the initiatives into epics. They split the epics into stories and the stories into tasks. So there was a splitting going on. So this is a, a yeah typical for 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 an agile organization. If you are in a more classical environment, you probably work on a program which is split into project, which is split into sub projects, and they are split into work packages or so. So there's always this kind of splitting going on in organizations. All right, so what does this mean? Um, we want to um, improve uh, uh, time to market of our initiative. So if we create focus, we can improve the time to market. But the point is we need to focus on the initiatives. So we need to limit the initiatives, right? Or we need to time box work on the initiatives or whatever we do in order to create focus. Let's uh, think what this means. Um, we make all our teams agile. That's exactly what this organization did. In this chain, where do I have as a team, what is my area of influence? Most likely not the initiatives. As a team, I can probably create focus around stories and tasks. And that's exactly the problem, right? So in this organization, um, the teams, they were creating focus around stories and tasks. They were defending their sprint goals, their whip limits and everything, but they were still working on a thousand initiatives in parallel. And what a surprise, none of the initiatives was uh, delivered faster. So the point is um, you need to, um, uh, yeah, you don't have to be surprised if you don't see any improvement in time to market if you're not focusing on these elements where you want to see the improvement. So in this case, we need to focus on the initiatives. Uh, teams cannot do this. Where can we focus on initiatives? Somewhere up there, whatever up there uh, means. Um, yeah. And up there is in a strategic portfolio, right? Um, and this was not present in this organization. Okay. Uh, what else was uh, somehow strange in this organization? The strategy deployment process. So if you just draw the timeline, then uh, what we see is in this organization, people were working on stuff. That's great because I mean, if you're working on stuff, then that's the reason why they are here, right? <laughs> then uh, the strategy was announced. There was this big town hall meeting and everything. And then, yeah, that's our strategy. And the consequence was that people are working on stuff. So not a lot of consequence, right? But then there was this end of the year approaching, it was coming closer and closer. And um, well, this caused that many um, people started to create PowerPoint slides, strategyfulfillment.pptx. And then what they did is they mapped uh, the stuff they were working on to the strategy buckets in retrospect. So they were like, okay, we were working on this project. This fits into the strategy bucket. This project fits into this strategy bucket. So that's not the point of, of, of strategy work. The point is strategy should to determine what you're working on. So the entire agile strategic portfolio was just um, odd. It was just not working in their case. So uh, this was cause number three, no agile strategic portfolio. Um, if I summarize the three causes, the three problems were, we didn't see any uh, agile interactions, we didn't see end-to-end -end flow, and we didn't see um, a, an agile strategic portfolio in place. Can you please go back again to our poll, pollev.com slash Klaus222. What I would like to see is, what are the biggest challenges in your context? So in your particular context, is it the interactions between the team, the end-to-end -end management, yeah, the polls are already coming in. Nice. So all three actually quite quite similar. Okay, portfolio is picking up. Oh, that's interesting. That's really interesting. I've. It's not very often the case that all three are uh, quite close together. But that's cool. Okay, so um, what I see here is that, well, you, you can somehow relate to 
to what I have talked about, at least it seems uh, from the poll here. So you have seen all these uh, problems already before. That's good, cool. Um, keep um, voting, please. Uh, as I said before, I will just include uh, the results to uh, the slides after the presentation. Okay, so uh, these were the problems. Now let's uh, get to some um, solutions. What were the first uh, solutions? Well, um, just an overview of the solutions, of course. We can't dig uh, too deep. We only have 15 minutes or so left. Um, well, one thing is establish actual interactions. That's what we did. Remember, this was the thing where we had so many dependencies uh, among the teams. So what did we do uh, to solve this problem? Well, we zoomed out from the team level and we built product boards. And this makes a lot of sense. Remember, the problem was that um, we had one team only working on one product. However, multiple teams were working on the same product. So what we did, we somehow uh, discovered which teams are working on the same product. Like for instance, these three teams were working on the same product. So what we basically did, we locked them into um, a room for a day and we were like, visualize the situation, how you guys work together. And yeah, what are you doing? Right? So we built a board one level above the teams so that the teams can coordinate. And when I say we built the board, it's not that someone built the board for the teams, the teams themselves built the board so that they can um, yeah, manage their dependencies across the teams. And that's uh, what we did for all the products actually. So the point is do not optimize organizational structure, optimize value delivery, optimize what you get paid for. Usually the customer doesn't pay you, or let me put it positive. Usually the customer pays you for good products and services. So optimize uh, products and services and organize around products and services. That's what we did here. Um, of course, one thing is that we um, build the boards, but the boards alone, they are just that object. So what we need to do is we need to have the right conversations in front of the board. So we also established agile interactions. So what we did is we did product stand-up meetings and product retrospectives. This means the teams were um, yeah, having a stand-up meeting across um, all the products and retrospectives. We worked with delegates. So each team sent the delegate to the product stand-up meeting. Then they were having a stand-up meeting there uh, across the teams. Uh, and then they were going back to the team and having a stand-up meeting on the team level. And that's um, how we ensure that um, yeah, we coordinate across multiple teams. If you do something like this, the number of unmanaged dependencies goes down. However, there are still some dependencies uh, remaining. And these are the, the dependencies between the products. Remember, if we change something in this product, we need to change something in that product. What did we do to solve this problem or to address this problem? Today, I would call it an operational portfolio. That's what we built. We built an operational uh, portfolio. This means um, we basically did pretty much the same like for the teams. So for the teams, we zoomed out to the product level. And here from the product level, we zoomed out to an operational portfolio level. This means, um, I mean, this is just a sketch of a board here, but you uh, hopefully get the idea. So we have product one uh, in one lane, product two in another lane, product three in another lane. Now we, we see all the products and their dependencies um, among each other on one board. And again, representatives of each product met in front of the board and they were having a conversation here. Yeah, um, yeah, and that's again, the crucial point. It's never about the board. It's always about having the right people to talk about the right stuff at the right time. So think of the actual interactions portfolio stand-up meetings, and we also did retrospectives on the operational portfolio level. So that's what we did to um, yeah, um, establish these action interactions and uh, to uh, solve the, the dependency problem. But there were more problems. Remember this long, huge board? Um, yeah, we also tried uh, to solve this problem. And what we did is we established end-to-end -end flow. And if you take a look at the solution, it's totally easy and simple actually. But the point is to get to the solution, like the change process behind it is way more complicated than the solution itself. The, so the solution is actually pretty clear. So what we did, we somehow simplified the upstream and we brought business on board. 
What does it mean that we brought business on board? Well, this was a quite old organization. They did not grow up with computers. So I guess they, they were 150 years old or something like this. So they had this understanding like this is business and this is IT and IT is just producing costs. So let's just not talk to them. They're just, yeah. <laughs> so uh, it, it was really very hard if we were like, okay, we need to solve this problem together. We need to um, manage the entire value chain together. So bringing business on board is really crucial when it comes to business agility. What a surprise. Um, but it's not the easiest part most of the time. And what we also did, we simplified the upstream. So we needed to have business on board. And then we could talk about, I mean, we could have a conversation with them. And they saw, OK, we are waiting. We are waiting. We are waiting. And we are, uh, we are, we are spending so much time and money just for generating papers can't we do, can't, can't we change this somehow? And then, yeah, we simplified uh, the upstream. Like you see here, it's, it's way shorter. And another thing is we could start, remember there was this yearly budgeting and now we could start uh, um, every second week with a new project. I mean, usually starting a new project is not the problem. Uh, usually organizations are quite good in, in starting work. Um, that's why we also created focus here. So we created focus. This means we need to finish something before we can start something new. Um, yeah. And as I said before, um, it's all about the actual interactions. Also here, um, we invited the business stakeholders to our standard meetings and to our retrospectives. What else? Finally, or uh, in the end, uh, as last point, we established an agile strategic portfolio. What does this mean? Well, remember they had this weird cycle where, the, where they were uh, mapping projects backwards to uh, the strategy. We tried to put, do it the other way around. So we have something like strategic goals. They, uh, based on strategic goals, we have a strategy. This means uh, out of the strategy, we, we derive outcomes and actions and work on them. Then we measure our outcome and we trigger a learning loop. And this learning loop maybe refines our strategy. So we need to get into this forward loop actually. And um, yeah, what does this mean to get into this forward loop and why is it important? Because we can directly um, yeah, derive uh, a strategy board out of this loop. Um, let's assume we have our st strategy items like the three to five years uh, strategic focus items. We can now split them up into, let's say, measurable outcomes that we want to achieve within a year. Each of these outcomes, we can split further down to measurable outcomes that we want to achieve in 90 days, like in a quarter or something like this. And now, if we know, okay, that's what we want to achieve in the next quarter, we can derive actions out of it, like, I don't know, epic stories, projects, uh, initiatives, whatever uh, you're working on, uh, to uh, achieve these uh, outcomes. And... If I see something like this, I already see a strategy board. The cool thing is we just need to add some lines and we need to remove some other lines and voila, we have a strategy board, right? So that's what we built. We built a strategy board. We, we brought the organization to a forward loop in terms of strategy and we created focus on this uh, level as well. And what a surprise. We also did actual interactions on this level. So well, we did uh, stand-up meetings and uh, retrospectives. Okay, so if we take a look at the solutions, three solutions. We established actual interactions between teams, uh, products and uh, services. We established end-to-end -end flow and we established an agile strategic portfolio. If we take a look at these solutions, yeah, then at least for me, one thing was getting so clear when I was working with this organization. And this is that business agility is by no means team sport. Business agility is company sport. You need to have the entire company on board and you need to make uh, the company agile on many different levels. And that's the last two slides I want uh, to, to share with you. That's something which helps me quite a lot uh, to get this message across. And this is the flight levels. So when we say the entire company, uh, the whole company is really a lot, right? <laughs> so um, where in an organization can we become agile? And this is, called, this is what we call the flight levels. 
Um, flight levels is like how high are we flying, right? In an organization, we can fly very low. If we fly very low, we see a lot of details, a lot of technical details. So flight level one is the team level, the operational level, the teams. We can make our teams agile. Perfect, good idea, right? Uh, usually an organization has more than only one team. So we will see multiple flight level one systems in our organization. However, as I've shown you before, it's not one team usually del delivering directly to the market without any dependencies. So usually multiple teams need to coordinate. This means these teams, they built fly a little bit higher and built a flight level two system. Flight level two is end-to-end -end coordination. Here we make sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time. If this is, if the teams are the keys, the flight level two system is the keyboard. We make sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time. And we connect flight level two and flight level one systems. This is the world of your products and services. That's the thing that's on the market, right? Usually uh, an organization has more than only one product or service. So we will see multiple of these flight level two systems in our organizations. If we have dependencies among these products and services, we can build an operational portfolio, right? Uh, but that's again, flight level two. But we can fly one level higher and one level higher is strategy. Um, the idea of the strategy board is, or of the strategy system is that we align uh, the work in the organization on the strategy and that we make strategy happen. This means that we connect the flight level three with the flight level two and flight level one system. Um, yeah. Most of the time an organization has more than only one strategy board because we are operating in different countries or we have different products and so on. So yeah, there is good reasons why we have more than only one flight level three system. So these are the flight levels. And for me, the flight levels make a lot of sense because they help me to understand where in an organization I need to establish um, agility. So it's not only the team level. We need to zoom out of the team levels, of the team level. And uh, another important thing, um, flight levels, so uh, a higher flight level, it's, it's not about importance. Flight level three is not more important than flight level one. It solves a different problem. But the point is, if we want to, if we want our organization to act agile on the market, we need to become agile on all of these three levels. And that's what the flight levels are um, actually for. All right, so uh, one more thing, if you're interested in uh, flight levels and how you can get this into your organization, there's an online course, just go to bit.ly slash flight levels intro. And if you use, uh, if you use the, the coupon code Agile Quebec, uh, you get 20% off of this course. In this course, um, yeah, we show you how, what flight levels actually is and how you can make use of it in your organization. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Klaus. I, I just need you to do a little operation, manual operation, because you're accidentally sure. promoted to host. So I don't know if you uh -huh. click on the participant <laughs> at the bottom. Okay, I can hijack the conference now. That's good to know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you Let click on part this works. participant at the bottom, do you see yep. it? Yes. Uh, and, and you click on my name and you need to put me uh, as a host. You're Eric, Eric now, right? Eric. Exactly, yes. Uh, you can do that. Make host. I can no longer hijack the conference now. Okay, perfect. Good, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> okay, uh, so now uh, we're pretty tight on schedule. So we, uh, I'll, uh, can you see the questions or you want me to? Um, no, I can't see them, sorry. <laughs> okay, so I'll try to take, uh, does anyone please uh, would like to ask a verbal question or maybe uh, put it in the chat so I can tell it to Klaus. Everybody's telling you great presentation, great stuff. This was great. Thanks. So I'm telling you all the good things. <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I don't read them fast enough. Okay, so I don't see. Uh, can we get a copy? Yes. Uh, Klaus confirmed oh. to me, but did we, you, you authorize us to put the presentation uh, uh, video available. Yes. Uh, yeah, the presentation video. I mean, you're recording it, right? Sure. Exactly. No yes. For me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No problem. I will share the slides, of course. Okay. So all I hear are thank you, and I don't see any questions. 
maybe some somebody has a question and I don't see it. Okay, I got a question here. How do you manage the flight uh, level three new in, new initiatives? How to get new initiatives on the flight level three kind of? Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, um, I've shown this forward loop. So we need to get into this forward loop. Uh, that, that, that's, that's the general answer. And the concrete answer is um, what I like to do is um, we have this, this three to five years uh, big goals we want to achieve, right? Uh, once per year, we somehow break this down to uh, one year of, um, things like outcomes. Then we break them further down to 90 day outcomes. And when we know what we want to achieve, let's say in 90 days, we, um, uh, yeah, we think of, okay, what are the actions we need to take to um, achieve this? So this is where we create our initiatives. And then of course, we need to have a common understanding. Are these the right initiatives or not? So what I, uh, I like to do is to have something like a strategy planning and then like a delivery planning. And if you have these two meetings in place and you break it down, that's actually how we are creating um, these, these items. And in flight levels, there is, there's more about this stuff. It also depends on your flight items and especially on your flight routes, like how are you taking decisions in your organization? So it's, um, yeah, you need to define it in the end. But uh, the, the short answer is break it down uh, to something like quarterly objectives. Out of the objectives, generate your initiatives and find a common understanding. These are the right uh, initiatives. Okay. And strategy planning and delivery planning. Yeah. Thank you. And one question that's very interesting. How do you convince managers that they need a strategy portfolio? <laughs> <laughs> How do you convince managers? Well, I think it's... Um, it's a little bit like psychotherapy. <laughs> you cannot convince someone to go on therapy. I guess uh, they need to, to see that there is a need for it. So, um, I mean, of course uh, you can do quite a lot of these awareness sessions like this presentation for instance, uh, helped me a lot to get the message across and it somehow resonates uh, with managers and they're like, okay, we need it. And there is something else like, I'm doing a shipbuilding experiment so where we are building paper ships and it's all about building up awareness. But in the end, you need to answer one fundamental question and that's what's in it for me. If um, the managers cannot uh, answer, don't have a good answer to this question, what's in it for me, it will, it, it's quite hard to establish anything, not only the strategic portfolio. So solve real problems in the end, then um, you're good. So it's not about agile, it's about what's the problem we are actually solving with it. And if you have a good answer to this, you will definitely get the buy-in. Okay, good. Another one here is management by product or by capabilities. What's better for strategy? <laughs> I guess that's a good one. So in the end, it's about what kind of silo do we want to have, right? <laughs> do we want to have a capability silo? Do we want to have a product silo? We can also have a market segment silo. We can have a product segment silo. So the point is um, we can build any silo that we want. And of course, some silos are better than others, but um, there's one thing, no matter how you organize, you will always end up in silos. So it's not so important. So the first thing should be, how can we establish these actual interactions uh, between the silos and across the silos? And if we are good in this, then we can optimize it with the right silo, actually. I would prefer a product silo, for instance, but that's not the right answer to, to your question. It's just an answer, but um, uh, the, the right uh, answer to your question, I think, is... Uh, no matter what you do, you always end up in silo and become better in management, managing your dependencies across the silos. And that's what you can do with building these flight level boards, for instance. Okay. And uh, how do you deal with non-believers inside the team? <laughs> I guess it's pretty much the same like before with the managers. So um, what's in it for me? If, if, if it's really, if you can't answer this question, 
it's getting hard. And uh, in the end, I, I, I pretty much do the same on the team level, like what I do uh, on the portfolio, strategic portfolio uh, level. It's about um, awareness, building awareness. And I'm most of the time using the same messages. I just frame it differently, depending on what's the problem they want to solve. Agility is, agility is actually a very rich and powerful thing you can do in your organization. Um, a lot of uh, people will become, I don't know, stress will go down, performance will go up. So you have a lot of these humane, like social kind of uh, things. Um, but there's also this economy part. So agility is not only about hugging trees. Agility is pure economic. So if you if you can shorten your time to market, this gives you an, a competitive advantage. You can also put some 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 dollar signs on it. What it actually means. So the point I want to make is um, find out what's the problem you need to solve, and then frame your message uh, so that uh, people can receive it. Is it so? What, what's the problem? Is it more like a financial problem? Then hit on the, the things like cost of delay and I don't know, create focus and so on. If it's more like a humane, like a social thing, find the other things that are important. The point is, there is so much in there in the agile space that you can really solve quite a lot of problems. You just need to pick those who really solve, who solve real problems, if this makes sense. Okay. And uh, here, I think we might go for the last one. We got a few minutes. And uh, how I got a question: How can you relate flight levels to safe? I don't know. <laughs> um, well, I mean, of course, I, I have an idea. So, I guess in two weeks, um, so we have a live YouTube uh, show which is called the Flight Club, <laughs> and uh, the next Flight Club, the the title is Safe versus flight levels. So we will have a representative from uh, the uh, um, Swiss telco, Swisscom, actually the largest telco in Switzerland. And uh, we will talk, they have quite a lot of experience with safe and with flight levels. And we will talk about this uh, in two weeks, I guess. So uh, yeah, tune into the show. And until then, I will hope that I will also find an answer to this question. <laughs> I mean, it's a big question. It's quite hard to uh, explain it in a minute. I, I can try it. Uh, there are no roles. There's nothing in flight levels. Flight levels is about you're allowed to think. And in SAFE, there's quite a lot of things you have to do. You have to do uh, these trains and everything. And then flight level is more like a thinking model, whereas frame, uh, where SAFE is uh, a recipe. But uh, yeah. Uh, watch the show and uh, talk to someone who really um, knows uh, safe. And that's Matthias Fernandez next time <laughs> in two weeks. Okay. No, well, I guess uh, I like the, the answer. That was a good answer. Uh, <laughs> thank you. So uh, uh, thank you a lot for, uh, for your speech class. Uh, it was very interesting. I think you have a lot of uh, great positive comments. Uh, Hope people see and liked cool. it and maybe it could take the course, uh, which is available there. And the video will be available online. So we'll send a doc uh, we'll send communication about that. Perfect. Cool. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Good. So I'll let uh, back, I'll let Carl come back to the uh, discussion and present the next. <laughs> Thanks. Have a nice day, class. Yes.